Amen. Let me get a little closer. Since everyone has moved back, I'm going to get a little closer. John chapter 20, we're looking at the appearances of Christ after his resurrection. You remember the last time we had our study, which was two weeks ago, how that Jesus appeared to two men on the road to Emmaus, Luke chapter 24. And do you remember, as Jesus was talking to them, what did he say about something that foretold of his suffering and resurrection? What did he tell those two men that they should have known? That they should have known that the... Right, but what told, them, what told them that? The prophets, the scriptures, the law and the prophets. So the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, was foretold in the prophets, in the Old Testament. And he spoke of the uh, scriptures, which were their scriptures that they had at that time, uh, would have been the Old Testament, foretold of the events that actually took place. So the gospel is in the Old Testament, in promise and prediction. In the New Testament, it's in reality. It is a reality for those under the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, it's in prophecy and prediction. And Jesus appeared to prove that he indeed resurrected from the dead. Um, John chapter 20 he appears to Mary Magdalene. He says in verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Now, some of the older translations say, Do not touch me. And some have come away from that thinking, well, Jesus' body could not be touched. And there have been actually very bizarre theories as to why that's so, that if you, if you touched it, there would have been some energy discharge uh, that would hurt you if you tried to uh, uh, grab hold of him. And that, that's bizarre theories that doesn't fit with what Jesus is actually saying. The New King James and other modern translations say, do not cling to me. She was touching him. She was clinging to him. He says, I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm going to ascend. He's not yet going to ascend right there on the spot. He says, I have some further appearances to make, and I am ascending to my father, to your father, to my God and your God. Now, verse 19, it says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, that's significant as well, because he resurrected on the first day of the week, and many of his appearances took place upon the first day of the week. So there's a shift of emphasis from the Sabbath to the first day of the week, and we see the importance of that first day, of course, in the book of Acts. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be to you. So they were locked down, we would say. They were in fear of the Jews. They were a frightened group of people. And they were afraid, if they're going to do this to Jesus, what are they going to do to us? I mean, think about this. They, they thought Jesus was going to be their military deliverer. If, if, if the military deliverer, the Christ, the Messiah, is going to be taken and crucified, what are they going to do to us? So they were in fear because they had that misunderstanding of the kingdom of Christ. So they had the door shut. They were locked down. And um, Jesus appeared in the midst of them and said, Peace be to you. 
And he says in verse 20, uh, or it says in verse 20, uh, when he had said this, he showed, him, showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father sent me, I also send you. So verse 21 is a shorter version of the Great Commission. The Father sent me, now I am sending you. The Great Commission that's elaborated on in the other Gospel accounts. Go preach the Gospel, go make disciples of all nations. Verse 22, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins of any, they will be forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. What 23 means simply is they would be inspired to speak God's plan of salvation. Those who would comply with that would receive the forgiveness of sins, like Acts 2 and verse 38. Those who would not o obey the gospel would have their, saint, their sins retained. In other words, they would not be forgiven. And so uh, that's what he's emphasizing there. Someone was not in the midst of this group. Thomas. Thomas was not here at, at, at this appearance. Verse 24 says, Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciple therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, he's been called Doubting Thomas, but he wanted the same evidence that was shown to them concerning Jesus. Now, this verse here, verse 25, emphasizes the importance of why Jesus had to appear in the very body he died in to verify he had indeed resurrected from the dead. Uh, so he had to be in the very body that he died in, of course, in a different condition, in a, in a, in a condition that's an immortal state, so to speak. But it was a physical resurrection so that he could verify this is the one who died on the cross. I'm the one who died on the cross, and now I'm resurrected. I have come forth from the tomb. Verse 26, And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. In other words, he just suddenly appeared in their midst. The door was shut. Verse 27, Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. I believe that verse 28 of John chapter 20 is the uh, apex, the, the central theme of the book of John. The evidence set forth that Jesus had indeed, indeed re resurrected from the dead. My Lord and my God. He said, look, here is the evidence. You, you want the evidence, here it is. And Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. And verse 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's talking about, of course, those of the first century who did not physically see Jesus and us. Everyone from the first century to this very point who has not physically seen Jesus with their eyes, physically touched him, but believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now the apostles uh, emphasized the fact that they were witnesses because they had been with him, they had seen him. In fact, the one who wrote this gospel account, if you want to keep your place here, look at 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1. 1 John chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1, John writes and says, That which was from the beginning, 
which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. John was an apostle. He saw Christ. He heard him. He looked upon him. He handled him physically. So he was an eyewitness. And that's exactly what he's emphasizing here in 1 John. The fact that he indeed was um, uh, real. That they were not seeing a spirit or a ghost or a manifestation. They were seeing uh, Christ indeed resurrected from the dead. This is very important because of the, the false religion that was being developed towards the end of the first century that really developed more so in the second century following the completion of the New Testament called the Gnostic religion. It said that Jesus didn't have a physical body. Jesus didn't have flesh. That he just appeared. He was a, a phantom of sorts. Well, John is emphasizing, yes, we saw him. We touched him. This was not some sort of a, an apparition. This is actually Jesus. He came in the flesh. And we were with him. Verse 30 and 31, John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, uh, John records, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, you, that believing you may have life in his name. So we see here that here is the proof. The proof given to these men who wrote these things down. John was one of those eyewitnesses who wrote these things down. He said, I wrote these things that you might believe in Christ. That you might believe that he's the son of God. And that believing you might have life in his name. That you might be saved. So we see the, the purpose of this gospel account here in verse uh, uh, 31. Uh, verse 30 also uh, mentions that uh, many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. Some of those were recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But um, he's emphasizing these things are written that you might believe in Christ. We look at our study guide, page 107. Uh, we're on number 4 the fifth and sixth appearances of Jesus. He appeared to the disciples with Thomas being absent to assist, uh, assist in establishing their faith. Jesus spoke. Jesus invited them to touch and he ate as well, the other accounts tell us. Truly, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. Second, he appeared to the apostles with Thomas being present. That's what we've just read. Upon examining the evidence, Thomas exclaimed the deity of Christ. The faith or moral knowledge of Thomas was based upon empirical evidence, whereas our faith is based upon written testimony empirical evidence is evidence that you can see you can touch you can you can detect with your senses we cannot uh, detect God with our senses but we can see the evidence all around us and come to the correct correct conclusion that God exists the same thing is uh, true with Jesus Christ we've never seen him we've never heard him but based upon the evidence that the Bible is the Word of God and all the evidence that's found not only in the Bible, but all the external historical evidence, we can come to the correct conclusion that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God, and know that it is a, a fact. Any questions or comments about that before we go any further? And we understand the importance and the difference between empirical evidence and circumstantial evidence when it comes to our judicial system, do we not? 
Do we, can we not convict a person of a crime based upon circumstantial evidence and know for sure they committed that crime? If we couldn't, then we couldn't convict any criminal unless we saw the act happening. If someone committed a crime and they left evidence, and the forensic people go in and they see the evidence and they, they draw the conclusion based on the circumstantial evidence. Can we conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that someone committed a crime even though we did not witness it, even though the judge didn't witness it, even though the uh, jury didn't witness it? We'd have to. If that's the case, we couldn't, then there are a lot of criminals in prison that shouldn't be in prison because no one saw them commit the crime. But the evidence that they left, I mean, you can have DNA samples, you can have fingerprints, you can have all this kind of stuff that you see on CSI, on the TV programs, and you can have all the things that are left there to, to draw the conclusion. Now, it's not perfect because we're not perfect as humans. And therefore, there can be innocent people that are, are put away in prison for crimes they didn't commit. But we can come to the conclusion that, uh, based upon the evidence, that something happened without us physically witnessing it. If that be the case that we couldn't, then we could only commit, we could only convict people of crime that we witnessed. And that people would be getting away with crime, crime and crimes and criminal activity all the time. So circumstantial evidence is how we conclude that there is a God. That's how we come to that conclusion there's a God, by the things around us that we see, and we come to the logical, rational conclusion there must be a God. So that's the difference in empirical evidence and circumstantial uh, evidence. Our faith is based on written testimony. John chapter 20 verses 19 through 31. <clears throat> now, John chapter 21, you see another appearance of Jesus that is just unique to the, the gospel uh, according to John. John chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan, Cana, in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And said to him, we, they said to him, we are going also. They went out immediately and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had uh, now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered and said, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw in because of the multitude of fish. This is very similar to an earlier mir miracle that Jesus performed in the early part of his ministry. Verse 7, Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net of the fish with the fish, then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of fi large fish, 153. And although um, there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after 
he was raised from the dead. Now, you see here uh, Jesus performing a miracle there in them catching that fish, the, that net full of fish, dragging it to shore there, and then Jesus preparing breakfast for them there. And for us, in our culture, eating fish for breakfast, that's a little strange, but in that culture, it's perfectly normal to, um, to eat fish as a breakfast food. And uh, so here he is showing himself uh, alive to them. And during the midst of this uh, appearance here, as they're eating this breakfast, uh, Jesus is going to have Peter restored, so to speak. It seems as though Peter is going back to his old profession, being a fisherman, because uh, as some have speculated, he just thought, well, I've, there's no way I could be useful to the Lord now. I denied him three times. But here he's going to be asked if he loves him three times. Verse 15. And so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. There's different words that's being used here. And it's a very interesting study to show the different words for love that's used in Greek. Agape and phileo, uh, the words for um, uh, loyalty love and the word for friendship and uh, emotional love. Um, that's an interesting study in and of itself. But he asked him three times to do this. And uh, he, each time he says, you feed my lambs, you tend my sheep, and you feed my sheep. He's saying, you're still going to be useful to me in the flock. You're still going to be useful to me. Verse 18. Most assuredly, I say to you that when you are younger, you gird yourself and walk where you wish. But when you are old, and you, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when, and when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Of course, we know according to history that uh, Peter was uh, captured under the emperor Nero and that he was executed by crucifixion and requested to be crucified upside down because he did not want to die the same way his Lord died. So, uh, of course, history bears that out. And John would be writing this several years after the fact because John was a, a very late book uh, of the first century. So he's telling him, here's what's going to happen, signifying what death he would glorify God in. He would die as a martyr. And so he is restoring Peter and says to him in verse 19 follow me then verses 20 through 25 just to round off this chapter says uh, then Peter turning around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following who's the disciple whom Jesus loved throughout the book of John John that's John's signature in the book the disciple whom Jesus loved verse 20 who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Talking about John. What, what about John? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, that, what is that to you? Follow me. In other words, you be concerned about yourself you'd be concerned about following me the concept of working out your own salvation if i if i wish that he remain until i come follow me verse 23 then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die yet jesus did not say to him that he would not die but 
if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? Of course, we know that John is the only one that did die a natural death. All of the other apostles were martyred. They were all killed for their faith. Verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So we're told there that not everything that Jesus did was written down, but what we need to know was written down so that we might believe in Jesus Christ being the Son of God and following Him as we ought. Um, on page 107, this uh, appearance of Jesus here, um, Jesus, number five, Jesus appeared to uh, seven disciples as they were fishing on the Sea of Tiberias. The Lord performed the miracle of fish catching, and He prepared breakfast for the disciples. We have a threefold confession of Peter. He had denied the Lord three times. And the Lord's threefold commission. Note, Jesus used the word agapeo for love the first two times, a word of strong devotion. But Peter used the word phileo for love, a word suggesting a warm affection growing out of a relationship and a close association. The Lord used phileo for love the third time. You see, Peter had made a boastful affirmation previously, but he failed. Remember, he said, I'll never deny you. No matter what others do, I will never deny you. But he did. Now, he is not so boastful, but in humble self-realization, he thusly responds to the Lord. So there is that play on words there, the different Greek words being used. This is a wonderful example of someone who failed miserably, but can be restored back into the service of the Lord. We can, we can fail, we can, we can stumble, we can fall and get back up and still be useful. And I believe that that's a great lesson that we see here uh, in Peter. Matthew chapter 28, let's look at Jesus uh, giving the Great Commission. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 28. <clears throat> of course, chapter 28 only has 20 verses. It's a more condensed uh, version of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and um, uh, his appearance. Verse 16 says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When, he saw, when they saw him there, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this is... Uh, one form of the uh, Great Commission and another uh, form of it, so to speak, is found in Mark's account. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Some believe that he may have made a different appearance and gave this instruction. So that's why it's, uh, it's a little different. Verse 14 of Mark chapter 16. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those things that those who had uh, said they had seen him after he had risen. Verse 15. And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, 
They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, here's what you find in this uh, Great Commission here as, as far as going into all the world, preaching the gospel to every creature. That means it's to be for everyone. The response is, whoever has faith and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Then in verse 17 and 18, he talks about the miraculous activity that you find in the book of Acts that was in the early church. The signs that would follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. Well, we see that in the book of Acts, the casting out of demons. Uh, they will speak with new tongues. We see that in Acts chapter 2, when the church began. All the Jews from all over the, ne all over the world were there for the feast day of Pente Pentecost. And so they spoke with new tongues. Verse 18, they will take up serpents. We see that with Paul when he was stranded in the shipwreck. Uh, a serpent bit him and did not harm him at all. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. This is the only thing that I do not find in the book of Acts anywhere. I don't find anywhere in the book of Acts where this is recorded. Of course, the book of Acts is, is writing for a purpose, not re recording every single thing. So uh, this is the one thing that I've gone through the book of Acts and have not found where they would drink anything deadly and it did not harm them. This would be something that happened that just was not recorded for us. And they would lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Of course, we see that, of course, all over the book of Acts. And then verse 19 and 20 says, So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 20 is a summation of the book of Acts. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. That's exactly what you have uh, in the book of Acts. Now, when you look on page 108, you see that little chart there as it talks about... Um, the Great Commission and everything that's involved, um, when you put all of those things together, you also find uh, some statements made in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 48, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in the name of Christ beginning at Jerusalem. That would be the starting point. We already saw what Jesus said in John chapter 20 concerning the forgiveness of sins uh, that would be a result of their teaching. And so when you put all of these statements together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, summarizing it, you see the plan of salvation. There's teaching and preaching that's done. People believe. They repent of their sins. There's baptism. The result is salvation, forgiveness of sins, the remission of sins. There's different ways of saying the same thing. So in putting all that together, you see that in, in that chart, you see the plan of salvation set forth. What is the maximum number of people, approximately, that saw Christ after his resurrection? 500. 500. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in the about eight minutes I have left in class, and let's talk about that. We don't have recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John this crowd of 500. But sometime during this 40 day period where Jesus showed himself alive, he showed himself alive to about 500 people at once. Now, what does the Bible say, both Old and New Testament, on the testimony of how many should something be established? Two or three witnesses. On the testimony of two or three witnesses, you can have something established. With the resurrection of Jesus, you have over 500 people that saw him. Over 500 so the fact of the matter is that it was a, a, a truth, a fact, 
that Jesus had indeed physically resurrected from the dead. That it is a fact that happened. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. And you have to understand that Paul is dealing here with some of the false teachers that were in Corinth that were saying there is no resurrection from the dead. And you have to understand that they probably got this influence from the Greeks. The Greeks' philosophy is that when you die, you're set free. Your body is the prison of the soul. And when you, you, you die, you're set free. And so resurrection meant you go back into your body, and in their minds, that's going back to prison. Why would you want to do that? And uh, that's why the Sadducees were s such unbelievers in the afterlife. They were heavily influenced by the Greek philosophy. Um, death was seen as a freedom uh, for human beings. Uh, there's no need to go back to a, a resurrected body. And so there were some false teachers that were saying there is no resurrection from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1, uh, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which you also stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Now, what are the scriptures he's referring to? Which? Old Testament. According to the Old Testament scriptures, Christ died. And of course, we know that from Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and, and various other passages. The, the Messiah would die for our sins according to the scripture. Verse 4, that he was buried... It was prophesied that he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. And that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Again, according to the Old Testament scripture, said he would resurrect from the dead. Peter quoted some of those Old Testament scriptures on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, to prove that he had res risen from the dead. Now, verse 5 talks about his appearances. That he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. Who is Cephas? Peter, seen by Peter, and then by the twelve. Now, if, if Judas was dead, Judas had committed suicide, why would Paul say the twelve? He's going to list himself later on in the verses. Now, did you say Matthias? I didn't hear you very well. That Yes, that's, that's the, the answer to that. He was including Matthias, who replaced Judas, bringing the number back up to 12. It dropped down to 11 after Judas had committed suicide. And then in Acts chapter 1, they needed someone to replace him. And the lot fell upon Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven. So he did appear to the twelve. Matthias saw Jesus after he had resurrected from the dead. So it was the twelve. The reason why I point that out is sometimes people say, there's a contradiction there. There's a contradiction in Scripture. And they try to use that to discredit the Scripture. But a little bit of reasoning goes a long way. It's not a contradiction at all when you understand what's going on in Scripture. Uh, verse number 6 after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present but some have fallen asleep in other words some have died the great majority of this 500 are still alive so we don't have verse 6 recorded uh, anywhere in the gospel accounts we're, we would only know this because Paul tells us this here in 1 Corinthians 15. Over 500 brethren saw him at one time. So we see that there was a, 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 at one time this mass viewing of Jesus. 
And the point that he's saying here is the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Some of them have died by the time Paul wrote this. But the great number of this 500 are still alive. You could go talk to them. You could go and, 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 and verify this. Verse 7. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Verse 8. Then last of all, he was seen by me as one born out of due time. This is talking about Paul seeing Jesus in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And he says in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy uh, to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. I don't deserve or to be an apostle of Jesus Christ because of my past and what I have done. Verse 10, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so we believe. And he goes on, beginning in verse 12, to talk about some of those who were saying there is no resurrection. We don't have time to develop this. We're, we're just about out of time. But he says in verse 12, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? Some among you in Corinth are saying there is no resurrection from the dead, but if this is what we preach, if this is the gospel the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, then how can some say there is no resurrection from the dead? And he, he uses logic here, beginning there in verse 12 and following. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, if that doesn't happen, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. Yes, verse 15, we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact that the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. Verse 17, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are of all men most pitiable. Some translations say miserable. Verses 12 through 19, he's saying, look, if what you're saying is true, here's the consequences of that teaching. If Christ hasn't resurrected from the dead, our preaching is vain. Our preach hold all my calls. Our preaching is vain. It's a waste of time. And as a result of that, you're still in your sins, and those who have died, they are lost. Verse 20, But now Christ is risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. And he goes into the fact that Jesus has indeed resurrected from the dead. He started off by saying, Look, there is evidence, evidence, that this actually happened. The witnesses over 500 people uh, in total saw Jesus after his resurrection from the dead. Far more than the two or three witnesses that are required by the law. Next week, uh, we will be traveling to Bayside for the gospel meeting. And so we're going to uh, hold off on our study of uh, chapter 13 which is about the ascension and the continued work of uh, Jesus. So be reading uh, chapter 13 of the study guide, and we will get to it when we get back into town, Lord willing.